Well, good morning. It is lovely to be here with you, both in person and online. And as we spend time in God's presence, it's good to explore his word together. I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 2 and starting at verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They've lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. We pray that God will speak to us through his word this morning. I can vividly remember the day when I learned to ride a bike. I had a small purple bike and it had training wheels and I was really content just zooming around our driveway. I had no ambition to have the training wheels removed. But on this particular Sunday afternoon, my dad took the training wheels off my bike and told me I was gonna learn to ride it without them. We started off with dad holding onto the back of the saddle as I pedaled along. And after a little while, he let go. And I was unwittingly riding the bike on my own. However, I kept turning round to see if Dad was still holding on to the seat. And every time I did, invariably I wobbled and fell off. Eventually, I learnt that to ride successfully, I had to keep moving forwards and I had to focus on what was ahead of me rather than what was behind me. There were some false teachers in the church in Colossae who were telling the Christians there to look behind them, to look back to old religious habits. 
Or they were distracting them from looking at Jesus by telling them to focus on alternative philosophies. So Paul writes this part of the letter to the church in Colossae to teach them the same lesson I learned when I rode my bike. You have to keep moving forward and you have to focus on what is ahead. And this letter is as much for us today as it is for that church in first century Colossae. And as we look at this passage this morning, we see that Paul was countering false teaching by reminding us of our status as followers of Jesus. In effect, he's saying, remember your identity. I don't know if you know the TV program, Who Do You Think You Are? Where famous people research their family tree and find out more about who they think they are now based on their ancestry. Well, I think Paul is kind of asking us the same question. Who do you think you are? But our, ident our identity is not found in a family tree. It's found in Jesus. Our core identity is to say that Jesus is Lord. That's who we are. People who say Jesus is Lord. Now, for the Colossian Christians, that involved a massive and dangerous shift of allegiance. They were part of the Roman Empire, and everyone within it was required to say, Caesar is Lord. It was an oath of allegiance. To say that somebody else was Lord was treason. But those first believers had courageously shifted their allegiance and become followers of Jesus. They declared, Jesus is Lord. And that's our starting point too. If Jesus is Lord, it means nothing else is. Ambition, work, status, friends, even family are not Lord. Jesus is Lord. Now some of us may be able to point to a specific moment in time where we said for the first time, Jesus is Lord. For me, it was on a beach in Exmouth at the age of six. But for others, there may not be a specific moment when you know that you made that statement, but you know now that Jesus is your Lord. And by focusing our attention on the fact that Jesus is Lord, Paul is reminding us that we can't give our allegiance to anyone or anything else. But just saying it isn't enough. What Paul wants us to do is to live our lives in Jesus. He gives us a mixture of words and images here. Planting and building. He said we're rooted and built up. A plant is rooted and it grows up from those roots, a building has its foundations and it's built on them. But either way, the point that Paul's making is the same. Churches are built on Jesus because he's our Lord. And because our roots or our foundations are secure in him, then churches can grow or be built up. And all of this is the work of God's Holy Spirit in us transforming us so that we become more and more like Jesus helping us <coughs> excuse me helping us to live in Christ following his teaching following his example and it's always worth us checking our foundations as church are we rooted in Jesus are we open to his spirit helping us to grow are we living by his teaching? Are we following his example? God's spirit builds us up. He enables us to live rooted in Jesus if we allow him. And one of the ways he do, does that, part of the way he does that, is by using the community of faith to strengthen our own faith. Our youngest daughter recently passed her driving test. And she's got her first car. And as parents, it's a bit nerve-wracking when she drives off on her own. But it's okay, 
because she's been well taught. And it's the same for church. We're strengthened in our faith because we've been well taught. Paul was one of the Colossians' teachers by post. There were others, such as Epaphras, who, who were there with them physically. But they were strengthened because of how they were taught. That's what he says in this letter. And if our faith is to be strengthened, we need to be part of church and receive teaching about Jesus. That's one of the reasons you're here today, physically or, or online. And God's Spirit can encourage us and strengthen us through teaching, not just in gatherings like this, but also when we gather together in small groups or just with a group of friends praying together. It's really important that we are strengthened by the teaching that we receive. It's interesting as you follow that just the first couple of verses which we've been unpacking so far, Paul kind of builds up this wonderful image of so much good news that he's overflowing with thankfulness at the end of it. He's got this attitude of gratitude towards God. First of all, he says, Jesus is our Lord. And I just want to ask you for a moment, think back to the first time you said that or thought that. Maybe it was even your baptism when you declared Jesus is Lord. Paul says we're rooted and built up in him. Think about how you have grown and are growing in your faith, built on Jesus. He talks about how being part of a church strengthens us. Think about the people God has used in your life to strengthen you, to help you to grow. Paul says all of these are reasons to be thankful to God. So I'd like us to pause for a moment and thank him. Think about those things, think about those people, hold them in your mind's eye as we pray together. Lord, we thank you that Jesus is Lord. We thank you for the teaching and instruction that we've received. Thank you that you, through your spirit, have rooted us in Jesus in order that we might grow. And we thank you for the people around us, the people that we're remembering who have helped us and continue to help us in that. Lord, we receive these things with gratitude to you and we bless you for them. Amen. Amen. Paul, however, doesn't leave it there. He's got a lot more to say. Don't worry, we're going to go a little faster. Paul writes to the church in Colossae to warn them about a number of dangers that they are facing. Things to avoid. And he gives them some clues as to how to avoid them. As a teenager, um, I, I lived in Torquay, and as part of the Boys Brigade Company, we used to go walking on Dartmoor. And we had ordnance survey maps, and they showed us where the bogs were to avoid, where there were army firing ranges to avoid, where the cliffs were to avoid, you get the idea. But we had to learn how to read the maps in order to know how to avoid those places. So have a think, imagine that this part of the letter is kind of like a map that shows us the dangers and how to avoid them. I wonder if you've ever watched the film Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I remember watching it as a child and being really scared when the child catcher came on screen. He lured children out of hiding with his pretty caravan and offering them lollipops. But as soon as the children went into the caravan, the sides came off and it was a cage and they were trapped. It was really scary. The first danger that Paul warns us about is a bit like that child catcher. It looks attractive, but it's still a danger. Many of the early Christians in the church in Colossae and, and actually across the New Testament church had been Jewish people who discovered that Jesus is the Messiah. 
And the attractive teaching that they needed to be aware of was teaching that was suggesting that in addition to following Jesus, they needed to follow all of the Jewish rules and regulations they used to follow. Things like circumcision, which food you could eat. And for them, those sorts of things were comfortingly familiar. A bit like your old teddy bear. Something that made you feel warm and fuzzy inside. But to do that was a bit like falling into the danger when you're learning to ride your bike and you look behind you. You wobble, you fall off. People Paul was concerned about were being drawn away from following Jesus alone and back to a lifestyle of legalistic Judaism. Paul describes this really in strong words, a hollow and deceptive philosophy, he says. I wonder how your beliefs have changed. Think back to what you used to think about, what you used to believe, the, the, the things that you used to base your life on before you became a follower of Jesus. Those things are familiar and they can still have an attractive lure for us. There's always a danger that we might revert to those things and in doing so be drawn away from Jesus by hollow and deceptive philosophies. Paul says we can avoid that by looking at Jesus. Look ahead, not behind. And he gives us an amazing image of who Jesus is. If you ever just want to focus on who Jesus is, this part of Colossians 2 is brilliant. Paul tells us Jesus is 100% God. Not just a good teacher, storyteller, miracle worker or prophet. He is completely God. Now if that's the case, anything that suggests either he isn't or you need something else is just a lie. Nothing compares to him. In Judaism, the physical sign that a man was in a covenant relationship with God was circumcision. And Paul says that we have the same thing. Thankfully, not personal painful surgery. He says for us as Christians, the sign that we are in a covenant relationship with God, the equivalent to circumcision, is our baptism. That's the sign that we're followers of Jesus. In baptism, we say we've died to our old way of life and we've been raised to a new way of life as followers of Jesus. We've made him head of our life and head of our church. And I want to ask you this morning, if you're thinking, well, I haven't been baptised, what's stopping you? Have a word with one of the leaders of this church if you think that that's a step that you need to take as a follower of Jesus. Paul says it's one of the signs that you're in a covenant relationship with him. Why is baptism a big deal? Well, if you look at verses 13 to 15, they remind us of what Jesus has done on the cross. Paul says he's the only one who can make us fully alive, life as God intended it to be. He's the only one who can forgive our sins, those times when we've put something or someone else or even ourselves, in the place that God deserves. Jesus has cancelled our unpayable debt of sin. Paul says it was nailed to the cross, paid in full. In Roman days, if you had a debt that was written down, when it was paid, it was put on a spike to show it had been paid. That's the image that Paul is giving here. And even though God has forgiven us, we know we can still feel guilty when we remember those things for which we have asked for forgiveness. But Paul says we no longer need to feel condemned. Jesus has taken those things away. People who opposed Jesus thought that they'd won. They thought they'd humiliated him by executing him in this terrible way. They thought they would destroy him by humiliating him on that cross. But because of Jesus' death being for us, he destroyed 
what they thought they had done. He took away the power that they thought they had over him. He triumphed over death. And there is no other philosophy, no other religion, no other belief system, no other person, no other way of life that can do what Jesus has done on the cross. And there's no religious way of living or moral code that can do for you what Jesus does. They won't make you holy, even if they do make you more moral. Only Jesus has dealt with all of those things and the problems caused by our sin. That's what baptism celebrates and proclaims. That's why it's a big deal. The next warning that Paul makes is, don't let anyone condemn or disqualify you. Now, here, Paul isn't warning the people about condemnation from outside. The criticism came from within. Some people in the church were teaching that even though they had Jesus in common, because other people believed different things to them, they were not proper Christians. They were inadequate, condemned, disqualified. And that sometimes happens for us, doesn't it? But Paul says that if we hold true to what we believe about Jesus, we should not feel condemned by people who believe other things about other parts of our faith. It is possible to be united in Christ and disagree well. In fact, we need to be able to do that. Asking the Spirit of God to help us to embrace the, the one another's of the New Testament. Things like honouring one another, building one another up, forgiving one another, loving one another. There's plenty of room in church for us to disagree on secondary issues. We can disagree about just war, pacifism, genetic engineering, sexuality, economic priorities, a response to climate change, doctrines of church, ministry, mission and eschatology and many others as well. And in Paul's day, the Colossian church was having an argument about whether you needed something else in order to be a proper Christian. Some people were saying that you had also to focus on angels. There was an angel cult in Colossae. And they were saying you needed angels as well as Jesus. If you didn't have that, you weren't a proper Christian. And Paul's saying, no. Your faith in Jesus is all you need. Don't let anyone disqualify you by adding anything else to it. And I have a feeling that there's a prevailing cult in our society today that we as Christians can inadvertently add to church. I think the prevailing cult of our society is secular consumerism. And in church, we can buy into that. If our church isn't dynamic, interactive, seeker-sensitive, charismatic, contemplative, with an all-singing, all-dancing worship band, we're not doing it right. And so people will go somewhere else. But our only qualification is Jesus. And being part of his body. Single-minded devotion to him is what being a Christian is all about. That's what maintains unity in church. Paul says, keep moving forwards. Keep your eyes fixed ahead on Jesus. Follow him. And when we do, we maintain our unity because he is what unites us above all else. I'm going to invite you to listen to a piece of music and reflect on what we've heard and thought about this morning. Reflect on whether you're moving forward or looking back. Reflect on our focus on what Jesus has done for us. The song is by a singer called Lauren Daigle and helps us to focus on the love of God. What have I done? What have you done to deserve a love like this? Let's listen as we remain seated together. Let's pray together.
Lord Jesus, when we think about who you are and what you have done for us, we marvel that you love us so much that you would do that for us. But we thank you and we love you because you did. We thank you that your spirit meets us where we are and takes us to where you want us to be. We pray that you will help us to focus our thoughts, our attention on Jesus and him alone. May we declare afresh today, Jesus is Lord. And Holy Spirit, help us to live in the reality of that. Amen.